Um, greetings, 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 and thank you so much for joining us for week 10. <laughs> week 10, can you believe it? Of 10 weeks in Jamaica Theatre Conversations from Jamaica to the World. <sighs> Bittersweet. I'm Magalie Neff, co founder and co artistic director of Akiba Abaka Arts. We are an international theater production company that creates plays, concerts, talks, and processes for making plays, concerts, and talks for the global stage. 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World is a talk series that has been featuring Jamaica's leading theater pioneers and practitioners. Each week, these amazing artists have been sharing their behind the scenes stories of Jamaica's theater community and have been offering their visions for the future. We are very grateful to work in collaboration with Ms. Nadine Rollins, the amazing Nadine Rollins, founder of Raw Management Agency and co-curator of this series. Raw Management Agency is an esteemed talent agency representing artists and groups across all genres in film, television, theater, voiceovers, branding, and endorsements. This series is made possible by our publisher, HowlRound.com, a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide, and our sponsor, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the City University of New York in Manhattan. Now, whether you're joining us for the first time or you have been very faithful and have been watching us weekly since we started this series on November 1st, we want to say thank you very much for being in our audience today. We are eternally grateful for you. <sighs> I'd like to invite you to go ahead and click the subscribe button down there and be a part of our growing family and while you're there, go ahead and click the bell and be notified of our upcoming projects and engagements from our channel. And you might as well just go ahead and follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We are Akiba Abaka Arts on all platforms. And now, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the hostess with the mostest, <laughs> the other co-founder and co-artistic director of Akiba Abaka Arts, Akiba Abaka. Let me tell you, this woman is all that and a bag of chips, the spicy chips, though, not the, the little plain chips. The, the hip-hop chips. Remember those hey, hip-hop chips? Hey. <laughs> 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 oh, we no. chips we used to get at the corner store for 25 cents a bag okay. <laughs> and you like them so much you get a couple of extra <laughs> honey that's barbecue that's you <laughs> oh man Magalie it's so great to be with you again week 10 and I, I don't feel like week 10 is the end I think we oh, well, you and I know it's not. It's the well, end maybe in this series per se, but it is not the end at all. No. You know, I think it's also a, a real opening for conversations. It's a beginning of a con of conversations in this space. We set a goal to um to tell stories of Jamaica and Jamaican culture that we is not always exported on brand Jamaica. And I feel that over the past ten, um, 10 weeks. Um, we've accomplished that. We've seen um, the history with the little theater movement and Miss Lou and the pantomime. We spoke with um, Oliver Samuels and Brian Heap about their days at the ward, even being able to hear a different perspective on Oliver, you know, how he entered into the world of theater and, and some of those stories that we had never heard before. Um, Brian Heap gave us the history mm -hmm. of the um, multi diverse, um, the diverse narrative um, of, of folks on the theater, um, even prior to the 20th century, even prior to the founding of the ward. And that was so helpful. And then we continued speaking with the playwrights and the next generation and, and learning about the queer narratives that are emerging on the Jamaican space. And now we are here in the Afrofuturism, talking about Afrofuturism. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? Where does that take us? And I, again, I just think this is an incredible time to be looking at Jamaica right now. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to in this conversation? Oh my gosh, just hearing what um, our guests have to say, really all that they have to share. Um, 
and just be, I'm always looking to learn something, you know what I mean? What did, what did I not know before? Or what did I know and sort of hadn't thought about in a while and need to really um, think more on, you know, and act on. So yeah, I'm just hoping to just, so I still have my notebook <laughs> here, my trusty notebook and my pen. We'll see how that's going to work. But um, yeah, you know, I'm just hoping to just continue to just learn, man, just soak up, steal some ideas. And for a first, you are going to actually stay in the conversation this week. I am. I am. <laughs> You are not going to leave us. You are going to ride this out because for those watching, Magali is um, a master teaching artist. Magali has been working with young people in Boston from ages seven to 70 because we got some 70 year old young people as well, um, but mainly working with youth and teens in the way of theater. And the topic of Afrofuturism definitely comes up with the population that she works with. So Magali is joining us as our, our expert to the next generation in the conversation. So let's get on with it. Afrofuturism is a practice that elevates Black liberation, survival, and advancement. It is represented in the arts, literature, and science fiction, fashion, spirituality, and in the dreams and aspirations of African diasporic people coming of age in the 21st century. In the theater, Afrofuturism caters to the creation uh, and the uncovering of myths that inform Blackness. Jamaican authors Nalo Hopkinson and Jean DaCosta are among the many Afrofuturists along with Octavia E. Butler of our time. As we enter the third decade of this 21st century, this 2021, to of Jamaica's leading Renaissance artists. Join us for this conversation on how Afrofuturism shows up in the Jamaican stage. Tanya Batson is a playwright, filmmaker, publisher, and creative consultant. Her love of stories grew while she was seated, like many of us, at her grandmother's feet, where she developed a passion for folk tales that shares through in her first collection of children's stories, Pumpkin Belly and Other Stories. Her play, Woman Tongue, received eight Actor Boy nominations, and her short film, Endeavor, earned the award for best script in the Kingston Anime Festival. Her writing has appeared in the Caribbean Beat, BIM, the Jamaican Journal, Caribbean Quarterly, and, Scott, and the Sky Writings, uh, magazine. She is the producer of the am animated short film Agwe and served as production manager on the short film City of Mind. Tanya has been creative consultant for the Auntie Rochi Festival and Arts in the Park project. And many of you may know Auntie Rochi is uh, associated with Miss Lou. Uh, Miss Lou used to say, my Auntie Rochi used to say. Is the, she's also the chair of the Lignum Vitae Awards um, and the president of the Jamaica's Writers Society. Tanya is currently publisher and editor in chief of the online magazine Susumba and its literary offshoots, Susumba's Book Bag, as well as the award winning independent publishing house, Blue Banyan Books, the fastest growing trade book publisher in the English speaking. Caribbean. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you so much for having me. It is great to be here. It is absolutely fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Tanya, it is an honor to be in conversation with you today. Michael Holgate is a prolific creative artist who consistently produces works in multiple disciplines. He has spent over two decades exploring the world of theater, dance, music, film, and writing. His body of work includes Garvey, the musical, the new TV series, Chill, the novel, Night of the Indigo, and he is co-author of the self-help manual, Your Empowerment, GPA. On screen, Michael has worked as performance coach and audition judge with the Digicel Rising Stars show 
um, on television Jamaica and played the role of Bubbo in the in the 2004 Jamaican feature film One Love featuring Kimani Marley. He is currently the head of the Philip Sherlock Center for the Creative Arts at the University of the West Indies, as well as a part-time lecturer and external examiner, uh, examiner excuse me, <laughs> at the Edna Manley College of, of the Arts. Michael is also the artistic director of the Ashe Company. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm excited to be in conversation with you and Tanya and everybody else. It's, it's going to be fun. This is a privilege and a treat. Happy to be in conversation with you. So let's just start this thing off by talking about Afrofuturism for a second. Let's frame Afrofuturism. Um, you know, when I think about Afrofuturism, I think of it as a, a kind of cultural tool or a cultural vehicle for me to think about my past, my present, and my future as a Black African woman. I call it um, my Afrofuturistic kaleidoscope, you know? And like a kaleidoscope, um, you look into it and there are, things are positioned in a certain way that allows you to see multiple perspectives and the perspectives are endless and they're beautiful and they're grand and, and, and they're intricate in their design. And when I think about um, what's in my Afrofuturist kaleidoscope, I think about Bob Marley's redemption song. Recall that song for a second. Let's just grab that song. I'm not gonna sing it because we don't have the copyright. One, I can't sing. Two, I don't want the Marleys coming after me. So, um, but think about the song, you know, it's a telling of a, a man in his contemporary time telling this story. This is where I, where they, they came, they, they captured me, they brought me here. I fought, I struggled. But the, my favorite line in that song is we forward, in this generation triumphantly. And when I think of Afrofuturism, that, though, that particular part of the song just speaks to me. It, it, it's, it's the thing I like to look at most. What's in your Afrofuturist, futurism kaleidoscope, Miss Tanya? You know, um, it is interesting that while I have been aware of the term Afrofuturism, it is, it's not, a term I would have prior to your inviting me to be a part of this conversation. It's not a term I would have applied to Jamaica. And the reason is simple. And I'll give an, I'll give an example. Um, uh, a few years ago, I was in China and the organizer of the program there, and they were in, um, West, uh, I get my directions mixed up. She was deep in China, in Nan China, and they were just opening up. So they're not that much in touch with, with the quote unquote Western world, right? And so she asked, where is Jamaica? So I said, it's in the Caribbean. And she's like, oh, it is? I thought it was in Africa. And I responded, some days it is. Because there is a way in which in many ways, many Jamaicans and um, to be exact, many black Jamaicans identify themselves as Africans. And we have not generally seen the need to use Afro as a definition for us. It is presumed that what we are is African. Um, and so it's not a term I would have would have thought of for us. I, I tended to think of it at, in relation to African-American. Um, but just as you, you, you described in your definition, there have been um, Jamaican artists who've been working in that form in different ways. And so for me, it is about taking the, the ground, the groundation, the, the traditions, the myths, all of that that makes up Jamaica. And you use it to translate the present and then slingshot that into the future. It is what, um, what, what Rex Netterford describes as inward stretch, outward reach. I am no dancer. Anybody who's ever seen me on the dance floor, no, I have no business on the dance floor, but the, the, the description is perfect for you. Look inside to extend um, your imagining of yourself and your reality into the future. I love that. And I think you, you, you call in another Afrofuturist, Rex, Dr. Rex Nelford, if ever there was one such person. 
Um, but inward stretch, outward reach. Brilliant. Magali, what's in your Afrofuturist kaleidoscope? What are you seeing? Yeah, um, for me, I hear that and I think stories. You know, stories, stories through um, music, through through poetry, through the oral telling. And I, I remember Octavia reading somewhere, Octavia Butler saying, I don't remember what she was responding to, but she said, um, I just knew there were stories I wanted to tell. And I thought, yeah, that's me. You know, whether it was writing or listening through song and how do we, how do we bring this song forth other than just singing it, you know, what is the, what's another way we can get the message of the song out? Um, same thing with the poem, right? Our first instinct is to recite the poem in, in our best cadence, but what are other ways we can bring it alive? And that's the thing with stories, right? Is, is really finding the different ways to bring them alive, to share them, however you get them. And that's what I see. And that's what I always think of. And I feel like we are a story, right? So years from now, we are a story that someone is going to, to tell and to talk about and share. So for me, it's about the stories and, and, and all their forms, again, through music, through poetry, through the oral telling, and then sharing those stories. So. Awesome. Yeah. Michael, what's in you? What are you seeing in your Afrofuturist kaleidoscope? So when I hear um, the term Afrofuturism, Black Panther, that's just the first thing that just comes to my head. Black Panther, that mm -hmm. thing that just took over the world. It just blew our minds. When I saw that production, I was just like, wow. Not because it was um, something that we couldn't have imagined, but because it was something that was dared to be imagined and put out there for the world to see and appreciate and everybody loved it, you know? And I fell in love with, uh, well, for me, black um, Afro Afrofuturism is, is, is a culture, it's, it's cultural aesthetic based in um, philosophy, based in technology, advanced technology, things we're not make yet. And so that is how I, I read it. And also in fantasy. And I think that it's extremely important that we as black people, we as Jamaicans, we as Caribbean people, we as the world embrace this because there's so much that we have to learn from the spirituality side of Africa and the technology side uh, that the world has to offer and from Africa and from Jamaica. And um, I'd interviewed a guy by the name of Kwame Kwe Arma some time ago. <laughs> Yeah. And he spoke about what he called the technology of spirit. I was interviewing him for some research that I was doing. And he, he spoke about the technology of spirit. And when I heard that term, it just blew my mind because I was just thinking the technology of spirit. That is what an embodiment of what Afrofuturism is for me. Mm. You know, Michael, I once read somewhere where you talked so eloquently about the need and the importance for Afrofuturism at this time. And you stated there is a gap between who we are, who we, who we were, there's a gap between who we were, who we are, and who we could have been. Yeah. And in that space, in that gap, there is this thing that we need to rediscover. Can you elaborate on that? Because I think that really centers this, 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 um, culture and this tradition of Afrofuturism. Yeah, so that is really what um, the basis of the research that I'm focusing on now, which I call Caribbean Mythery. Mm. And it's about, as you said, who we were, who we are, and who we could have been. Because who we were, there's a gap, there's a big gap between who we were and who we are now, a 400 year gap where there has been a lot of dislocation and, you know, stuff that happened. And then who we are now, we, we are an, uh, 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 an amalgamation, a mix-up mix up thing of so many different um, cultures, but still based in our African identity. And who we could have been is where we could have gone had that 400-year thing not happened, right? So now there is something in that space. There is something in that space that is powerful. It's like a triangulation, a triangular space 
um, you, um, not, not the one that is causing planes to disappear, but maybe, but it's a triangular space of power and energy and vibrancy and life. And we can tap into it as African people, as Jamaican people, as everybody. And, 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 and so I'm tapping into it and calling my tapping in, not Afrofuturism, but Caribbean metry and looking at how we can use this to empower black people, empower young people who are black, Jamaicans, Caribbean people. And that's, that's what I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. I love the way you frame that, this idea of a magnetic um, flow uh, that's always been here. I love also what you're saying, Tanya, that this has always been here. Um, it's like currency. It's like the currents in a river or electrical currency and magnetic fields. And, 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 and the lives we've lived and the lives we are living and the lives we are to live is creating and growing this field. That is awesome. That's awesome. E electricity has always been about. Sorry, Tanya, for jumping in. <laughs> no, no, no. Electricity has always been about. Yes. But, but we learned how to tap into it at a particular time in our history. This thing, and I do believe that there is this, this as, as, as Kwame Koyama said, this, this technology of spirit that we have been tapping into over a period of time as Africans in the diaspora, and especially now, it's the artists who are leading the way. The artists are always leading, leading the way, you know, and, and technology will catch on to the technology of spirit. Technology will catch on to the, the creative technology that is being put out there by us um, artists. Nice. Tony, you were going to say something? Um, what I found interesting, and it, 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 it swings back to your um, introduction, um, where you mentioned Jean da Costa as one of the um, as as one of um, the Jamaicans who looked at Afrofuturism, and it talks it, it links back to to what Michael is saying about making of Mithri. Now, a lot of us in school did escape to Lathman Peak, but I bet most of us didn't think of it as futuristic. And I always you just frame escape to last man peak. Okay. I know we're going to talk a little bit more about it later on when we talk about okay. your work. But you escape know, to last man peak was a escape to last man peak was a novel written in um, in nineteen. It was published in nineteen seventy five. Why am I forgetting that? It's the same age as me. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was published in nineteen seventy five, and what it does is it looks at um, ten Jamaican orphans in a time when a Vir virulent flu has wiped out much of the Jamaican population and they're left alone and they have to make their way to safety from Spanish town way up into the hills of Falmouth where Lassman Peak is. And so that book, though set in, written in the 1970s and the author doesn't declare a time. When mm -hmm. I interviewed her, because as, as you said, we'll talk about it. When I interviewed her, um, we're having a conversation and she says she never imagined it in 1970s Jamaica. She imagined it at some point in the future. You know, so it is, it is interesting that, you know, 2020 happened. <laughs> but um, yeah, but so, so she was a writer working in that, um, making Mithri, imagining a futuristic landscape, a futuristic dystopian landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but we never... Um, grappled with it as science fiction. Mm. We just grappled with it as fiction, you know, and, 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 and how we name these things and how we explore these things and what we think or writers are doing, you know, is a thing. And, and, and that's what Michael is talking about as well, are catching up. We as Jamaicans are, are, are playing catch up with what people were doing quite some time ago. And by people, I mean other Jamaicans, Jamaican artists were doing quite some time ago as we understand you know, the multiple layers and the levels of what they were working with, that we were producing these things way before these labels were invented, even though we never used that label, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's a great segue, actually, because I'm <laughs> listening to what you're, what you both were saying um, about how Afrofuturism lives for you. And so I'm wondering, what are you working on, right? What are you working on and how does Afrofuturism show up in your work? One well, of you. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump off since I was just talking and since it's, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a good segue because one of the things I'm currently working on is um, through our production company, Have a Ball, um, a company I run with Annalisa Chapman, um, 
it, we recently acquired the right to, um, we, we, we recently acquired the option um, to turn Escape to Last One Peak into a film. And I've been working on the script for that. Um, so that's one of the things I'm working on. I'm also working on a script for a um, animation, a Jamaican animation series based on Jamaican folklore, um, which is also set in a futuristic past is how I'm going to describe that. Like um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's the, the working title is All High. Um, and so that plays with the idea of the old hide, which is a woman who sheds her skin and turns into a ball of flame. And so through that story, I'm exploring female empowerment and fire, not in the concept of bona fire, but just in the, in the, the concept of fire as a redemptive um, force, as well as a force that can be destructive or it can provide a space for rebirth, depending on how it is used. And of course, I'm working in publishing. Um, I continue to run Blue Banyan books and Blouse and Skirt books. Um, yeah, and um, that's that's what I'm doing. You know, you you talk about old hag. I remember I, I wasn't old enough to read, to read, to get too far into the reading in, in Jamaica, but I used to read my brother and sister's uh, books. And that story, that myth used to scare me. And it scares me today. And when I think about Caribbean people and how we work inside of Afrofuturistic spaces, you know, th th those stories are just as myth, even as mythology, they're very visceral stories. How are you going to bring old Hyde into the 21st century? Well, well, look at it this way. When I, the couple of times I've done soft pitches to people and I explain the old Hyde myth and they're, they're done Jamaicans, they go, Wait, what? And that's a story for <laughs> children? What? <laughs> like, you know. um, so what it is, and I haven't yet read this novel, but it's on my to-read list. Um, and uh, uh, Cordella Forbes, whom I just finished her ghosts, she again also does Afrofuturism without using the label. Um, I just finished her her novel Ghosts, and she explores this old hide myth as well in A Tall History of Sugar, which is on my to read list. And I want to see that. But it's about taking an idea, a base idea. And this idea is supposedly the old hide is an evil creature who sheds her skin. And, you know, and I'm like, why do we have to presume she is evil? You know, so it's about questioning some of these presumptions. You know, what is it? Um, the, the, the evil witch, when you think, when you think about Dorothy, I, I, I thought about the other day, I was like, hold on. Dorothy is supposed to be the good girl, right? She, her house fell on the witch, killed her, and she stole her shoes. And she is supposed to be the good person. <laughs> Maybe we should question some of these narratives, you know? And so how I bring it into the future is to question that narrative, to take a myth which yeah, is scary and is, but is interesting. Peel back some layers, use other elements of the culture, look into it and hopefully create something new and exciting. And, and truthfully, if Harry Potter, if Harry Potter can come into this time period, why all high can come into this time period? It's the same, it's well, not the same, exactly. but it, you know, it's, it's, it's the same. It is, it is. For me, so what, what I'm working on, what, what, you, what I'm working on at this point in time is a production called Riot Act. So with the Ashley Company, we have a, we well, we now have a production house that does film and video and, and live streaming and that type of stuff. And so I'm taking this opportunity to rework a script that I had before called Riot Act. And Riot Act looked at what is Afrofuturism on stage, and it looked at how the um, Dotty Bookman, who was a Jamaican who went to Haiti and helped to kickstart their Haitian revolution with a prayer, and um, how his bones were transferred back to Jamaica. Somehow it was placed in a museum, and some people came to experience, you know, to look at the exhibit, and they were taken away into a black space, you know, and Dotty Bookman is the spirit that trans transferred them to this black space where they learned so much more about themselves, about blackness, black identity, black consciousness. And so that's that's the production that I'm working on now and it's called Riot Act. And I'm, I'm making it into a film, I'm pivoting somewhat. 
you know, you mentioned Bookman and people have this sort of, um, they think either he's Haitian or he's Jamaican and they don't see the, the connection and the, and the role that he played. And mm -hmm. so it's amazing that this story is, is coming out or is being worked on. Being worked <laughs> and it's, it's, I'm, at the, I'm at the stage of reworking the script because it was actually originally done for theater and it was staged. I think Tanya reviewed it. And if okay. you didn't give a good review, Tanya, but, <laughs> <laughs> but Tanya reviewed it, if I remember correctly. And now we're reworking it for um, as a film. Yeah, and, how, and what, I, and I just want to hear more about um, sort of like what he means to you and why you chose this story. You know, interestingly, I was working on the production. I was working on Riot Act. And I was really talking about our Jamaican heroes. So Paul Bogle, Sam Shaw, um, George William Gordon. And I was talking about, you know, what they meant to us as Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. And I, as, as I always do with my, my productions, I, I did some, I do research. And I went and did some interviews with um, a lady by the name of Alice Berry. And she said something about, and you know, in passing, Dottie Bookman and blah, blah, blah. And I said, Dottie who? And then she said, you don't know who Dutty Bookman is? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. She said, big, big you, big grown man, you don't know who Dutty Bookman is? I said, no, because I did not, there's certain things we just don't learn in schools. Mm, yes. There are certain things we don't learn in schools. And maybe, maybe Tanya did learn, maybe some other people learn in schools, but I just was not in that class. And so I became fascinated and I said, no, I have to include this as part of the story. And that's also what it is that, um, you know, we're doing with Afrofuturism because I think it's important that Afrofuturism is a way of bringing alive myths that are our myths that we did not know were our myths. You know, stories, histories um, about our people that have not been included in our education system. But now, if we just fling it on the people, I mean, if we just throw it on the people, in a certain <laughs> way, they will not necessarily get it or really or appreciate it in the way as if you put it in a story. If you put it in a story as a myth, as, a, as, as something futuristic bought from the past and, and, and allow them to live it in this, this, this fantastical fantasy world, um, it's a different thing. They still get the information, they still get the message, they get the empowerment and they don't reject it. And that is what, that's what I love about the whole concept of, of, of Afrofuturism. Mm. And, and that is how I, am, I, I have been using it. And I'm sure the same for, for Tanya. Mm -hmm. You know, just want to jump in here with um, an observation as you talk about Old Hag and Dutty Bookman and what we learned as children and how these stories were told to us. One of the things that I really love about Afrofuturism is it's definitely, it starts in the United States or it's named in the United States somewhere in the early nineties and African-American, um, <clears throat> continental African-Americans um, who are coming of age in the new millennium, they're the ones who really took it up. And, and you, it, 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 in some ways it's kind of like African-American, um, uh, it's like a, a African-American punk movement. But I, I, I never like to say, this is like this. I think a thing, it, a thing is what it is, you know? And yeah. inside of it, however, is this opportunity to fill in the gaps about what we know about Africa, what we know about what happened to us on the different lands, the different bodies of land on the on this side of the, the globe. Um, for example, I remember when Fela came out. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, I think that's when I first started getting to Afrofuturism, um, was when Fela first, the Fela, the musical about Fela Kute was on Broadway because that culture really turned out to Broadway. They showed up and they showed out um, at the theater. And so, you know, Magali um, is, Magali is of Haitian descent and D Dutty Bookman is, 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 is Haitian, it's Magali. <laughs> and she grows up knowing that Bookman is her. There's a whole band called Bookman Experience. That is, it's theirs. Haiti has, he is their hero. 
I grew up in Jamaica, and it's not till I'm in my 20s at the University of mm-hmm. the West Indies that I learned that Bookman is mine. That Bookman was Jamaican. But through the arts, through this cultural vessel, we can learn about different parts of our history in whether it's um, music, whether it's fashion, whether it's science fiction, people are telling bits and pieces of the stories that we're not necessarily getting from the academy. And that's one of the things that I love. Old Hyde is, and I've just learned, is as much Trinidad's, because she's a Sukayant in Trinidad. Mm-hmm. She's in Grenada. She's Bar- She's all of ours. So this culture, right, of um, kind of open source conversation into who we are as a global African people, this culture that is being formed and growing of Afrofuturism is allowing us to write and rewrite our stories. Would you say, Tanya? I definitely would. And I, a part of what I love about what you said a while ago is talking about the gaps, right? Because there is yeah. so much that, um, f- first, let me say, Michael, you never missed the class. It wasn't in the class, right? There is so much we don't know about that, right? <laughs> or we were taught about it in ways that was just uninteresting. And, and I'm sure we're going to talk about the future later. So I won't want, and I don't want to go into that some more. Mm-hmm. But um, the, the the thing of it is that there is a lot we don't know about who we are, where we've been, and where we come from. And some of that we need to unearth through. Um, through history, some of that we need to imagine. And we need to give ourselves yeah. permission to imagine and mm-hmm. imagine differently. And we keep um, behaving as though if something is not sanctified by a historian, then we have no business thinking that. And we need to step away from that. You know, I mean, there, there are ways in which, and, 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 um, w- the, this phrase that goes in my head all the time is, um, I'm sure he didn't make it up, but I, I'm not sure where it came from. It could be the Bible because I realize Bujus, a lot of my favorite Buja quotes were actually from the Bible, <laughs> um, where he says, um, you know, the half has never been told. Yes. For Black people, it is way more than the half that hasn't been told. And I remember growing up, my grandmother would often refer to people as ready which I thought was one word, right? I didn't know what a Redibo was. I okay. didn't know it was a race of people. It wasn't until I was at university and I was reading um, uh, Tony, Tony, oh my goodness, The Song of Solomon, Tony Morrison. Oh, Tony Morrison, yeah. I was Tony Morrison and I, she was talking about the Igbo. And I was like, oh my goodness, the Igbo and Redibo. Talk about disparaging me are the same people. Mm-hmm. I, I, I I never would have made that connection, you know. Um, and so there, there because there, this is not something we were we were taught, you know. So it is. It becomes a gap. It's it's actually more than a gap. It's a chasm, you know, of of an absence of knowledge. Um, can I just, I'm just going to contextualize something because you just hit, you, I'm, I don't want that to walk away. We are not going to leave what you just did on the floor. We're going to pick it up and we're going to look at it properly. So ready ball. And it, it, cause now you're going into my favorite topic, which is language, right? Because I believe we speak a Jamaican language. We don't speak a Creole. We do not speak a Patwa. We speak our own language that is composed, that has, that is formed by many other languages, but we have our own language. And when you think about ready ball, I grew up knowing that word. That's a derogatory term that it is. we call, I'm going to just say it. Okay, to all my light skinned family members, we call light skinned people in Jamaica ready bone. Just like in America, we call red, you say red bone, right? Mm-hmm. Red skinned people, right? And I grew up thinking that's what ready bone meant. Oh, look at them ready bone, the red, them red people. You know, I have people in my family called reds, right? So it's interesting. And, and with all, I didn't put it together, right? the red Igbos. And there are a race of people who were red Igbos. Um, and they, they would have come over on those, um, on those boats. 
Yeah. So look, and, and you use, we talk about Afrofuturism, you talk about Song of Solomon. Exactly. What a book to really talk about. Ooh. We're going to learn who we are through these ring games. We're going to learn, continue, go ahead. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I mean, and so we, 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 I, uh, and, and, and I'm always going to come back to the world of books because books are my jam. And I think a part of how we, we can close that chasm is by one, interpreting more of our books in different arts and media. And that is, that, that is great. And I'm talking about um, that Afrofuturist space is to look at um, the synergy that um, uh, Hopkinson made with Derek Walcott's um, uh, th the three brothers, Tijon and his brother. Tijon and his brother. Brown, yeah. Brown Girl in the Ring is a literary imagining of Tijon and his brothers. You know, talking about that Jamaican, Jamaican St. Lucia connection. Um, and then, you know, so it's it's reimagining that space, looking at those ideas. And I, I recently read um, Sylvia... So I, I keep thinking Sylvia Plath, who is a very different person, Sylvia Winter. Sylvia Winter, um, a Jamaican writer and academic, ridiculously brilliant. Um, she did a, a novel, The Hills of Hebron. Um, I think that was from the 60s. It explores um, the, it, it, to a degree, it explores the flight of, um, what's his name? Um, Michael, help me out. Guy from August Town. I'm Miller. No, uh, oh, yeah. you're talking about um, yeah. Bedwood. Bedwood. Bed, 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 Bedwood. Right. He was a, he. Bedwood was a right. minister. Yeah. And he and a, a Christian minister, and they were going to go in the tree and right. slide. Yeah, Bedwood. Right. Yeah. Right. So I loved how. So she takes a minister, um, a charismatic preacher, and builds a story around him. Not set in August Town, but it is interesting how that book, um, which is not. It, it, so it has that line. And when you read Kai Miller's August Town, which is also a part of that, looks at that from a whole different lens, it, it looks like a foreword to Kai Miller's August Town. But at the same time, and in a very different way, um, you look at John Crow's Devil by um, Marlon James, and it also feels like a descendant of this book. So there, there's ways in which our artistry is having conversations and a lot of these conversations in the space of rebuilding myth, because I think a lot of times, um, maybe it's because we spend too much time by ourselves, artists reflect on, on the absences and find ways to fill them. And I think in that, um, and I'm, I, I'm going to say to, 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 I'm not going to say it's your word, um, Michael, because I'm not borrowing it from you. I'm taking it from Erna Broadwell. Yeah. To take you into that black space, yeah. you know, um, you, you find that the artists are communing there, even when they're not talking to each other, even when they may not have read each other's work. There is something where the work is 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 creating a resonance, and it is because of these gaps, you know, these spaces that need to be filled, and that's what a part of this this rebuilding on our myth you know, taking us and filling us out and, and showing a way more dynamic and way more versatile and way more well-imagined image than, than we can have. And, and I would love to get started on Paul Boga, but I'm not going to because I'm talking too much and I need to stop. Well, you're not talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. But I'm listening to you all talk and I'm listening to um, you all talk about the stories that need to be told and, you know, you're not hearing the stories till you know certain points of your life, and then I think about the future, right, and how important these stories are for us now and in the future. And then in time, you're talking about reimagining, and me being the person of the youth, right? I'm thinking, you know, as we, as you, as all of us, imagine the future. How do you envision um, the 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 role of the youth? Right. And what is their role in this reimagining? Right. When you think of our youth, you know, how, you know, how are they part of the process? I, I think I think the first thing we have to make sure before we get to their role in order for them to play their role. Right. Um, let me let me first say what I enjoy about today's youth is that and it's also what I find most frustrating. Um, I'm over 
40, I can be allowed to be crotchety. Um, what I find most <laughs> frustrating is they're not waiting. They're not waiting on permission. They're not waiting to get enough experience. They're just doing, they're like, I, I want to, I want to write a book. I'm just going to write a book now. Okay. I'm 12 years old. I'm going to write this book and I'm going to get it published because it's possible. And there's a way in which you might go, child, sit down and learn first. But then there is a way in which I also have to go, man, if I had thought to do that when I was 12, I would be in a whole different space right now. So even while my, my old woman self wants to be like, sit down and learn first, I also have to respect that. And that is a beautiful thing about today's generation. And they also have so much more access that is that that to, to a lot of things. And they do not have to wait on seeing it in a classroom. That said, what we have to make sure we do is we have to make sure that there is stuff for them to access because we have allowed too much to get lost, right? We have allowed too much of the stories to go untold. There's just too much that they do not know. And we have um, forced them to think of things as reading as uncool. And it's not because they're not interested. It's because, you know, we're, we're gonna be like, no, stop playing, go take up a book. And, and the go take up a book is a punishment. You know, we need to allow them the freedom to be. Yes, they need, you know, I was, I was talking to a parent recently and I was like, don't feel bad about disciplining your child. There's a reason God invented parents. You know, kids be crazy. They cannot raise themselves. They do need some guidance and structure. But what we need to do differently, and it's one of the things previous generations may not have done as well in an attempt to make sure we're raised with manas. Um, is that, you know, there, 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 there may have been too much reining in. And so we need them to have that freedom to imagine and reimagine differently and, and think about themselves as a part of the picture. You know, it is, it is a critical part of imagining in that way, of seeing yourself. It's like, I, I don't remember when I thought my being a writer was an actual thing. I remember always loving stories and always writing, but I didn't grow up thinking a writer was something I would become. And it's not because nobody ever told me I couldn't be a writer. It was more that I didn't understand that it was a thing I could be, you know? And so that is what I want to see for young people. I want um, us to just, you know, mash down the whole concept of the box. If they want a box, they will build the box themselves, you know, but it's just to open up that the whole world for them to reimagine how they see themselves in it. That was really long-winded. No, it's perfect <laughs> and it's beautiful. And I think that um, what's important is seeing themselves in it. Yes, I agree. But seeing themselves as powerful beings in it. It's the empowerment of our young people that we want to talk about. And that empowerment comes, it's just like what Black Panther did for a generation, our generation, the generation before us, the generation after us, is that, I mean, it's a whole heap of people were impacted by Black Panther because we could see a Black man in a position of power, an entire um, race, our race of people um, from a special place in positions of power creatively ex exhibiting all that they want to exhibit, demonstrating all they want to demonstrate. And in the same way that a Harry Potter could make these young kids from England and all around the world feel like, you know, I might be a little, wiz a little wizard and I might be able to do these wonderful things and I might be able to do this and that and so on. It's the same thing for our black kids. They need to see themselves in productions. They need to see themselves in films. They need to see themselves as these little um, genius power kids who can do things because those that that kind of imagining, as Tanya has been saying, taps into a certain part of our brain, a part of our mind, and that it it, it explodes and and gives us opportunities and possibilities and prob probabilities that we never thought were possible before. So just because you might not be a Black Panther who can fly um, off the the roof of a car and roll and not get hurt and stuff like that, doesn't mean that seeing a Black Panther um, character will not give you a sense that metaphorically you can fly. You have... And 
Um, All of these oh. things, and this is what this Afrofuturism um, does for us. That is what this fantasy does for us, this Black fantasy. If, if I can interject, Michael, yeah, um, wonderfully put, but if, I'm, if I could just um, edit you a little bit and point out that one of the key parts of the beauty of Black Panther wasn't just the male figure, but the predominance of, well, of strong, mm -hmm. diverse female characters. And I use diverse with a common D to mean the multiplicity of female characters, mm -hmm. because usually in superhero movies, the women don't really matter. They're mm -hmm. not even sidekick. They're in the shark mm -hmm. clothes just for the shark clothes sake. <laughs> you know, you're like, I'm yeah. like what, why are you wearing that? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. and but the the what one of the great things about Black Panther that the film did right is that it it really properly developed the female characters, and it is Absolutely. it is very important that we develop both sides of our schism. You mm -hmm. know, um, the male side as well as the female side, and the you know, and, and the fluidity in between, right? Because it, Indeed. You know, we can break down Black Panther and, you know, I can, especially the different, um, you know, my favorite aspect, you talk about the women, is the Amazon women that no. were represented in, in the Warriors, the sisters there, because that's a myth. That's an African myth that I was very proud of Marvel that they were able to get that in there. And speaking of myths, I um, and touching on what you were saying, Michael, about the power uh, about what is what is the role or what is the place or what's the opportunity for young people. I really love what you had to say because the, the, the graphic for this week's, if you notice, every week we have a different graphic. We have, we've been working with amazing graphic designers over the past 10 weeks. And every week we have a different graphic. And so this week it was just like, what are we gonna use as our background image for Afrofuturism? What are we gonna use? What are we gonna use? Anansi Web. And I use the web. It's the only thing that positions Afrofuturism in Jamaica for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was talking to the graphic designer and saying, I know it's a spider web, but let me tell you, that's more than a spider web. And this thing, a spider man ain't got nothing on a Nancy. Okay. <laughs> I grew up as a kid, and I, tell, I left Jamaica at a very young, tender age, you know, but one of the things I left Jamaica with was the Nancy stories. And you talk about the power, empowering young people through storytelling and myth theory, right? Mm -hmm. I remember, uh, nowadays, I've heard, since looking back into Jamaica, I've heard Anansi is, is not celebrated and, and well-received anymore, and he's considered a bad figure. But when me was a me, Anansi was our hero. And I remember being this, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest, I've always been a little cheruby, I've always been a little pushover-looking kind of kid. And I loved, um, but I'm not a pushover. <laughs> but I, what I loved, <laughs> what I loved about um, Anansi was he was a little spider. So a girl like me, a lot, I aligned myself with him because I was like, Anansi's not big. He's black. He's a spider, but he uses his mind. And so I focused my mind in the classroom. I remember when it was time to learn to read and write, I said, I'm going to be the best. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win every week. We had an award for best spoken English, all of that. And, um, and I remember thinking if Anansi could use his brain and he was this little spider who could be crushed, then I can do this. And you know, I just aligned myself with this little spider. And inside of that, there's so many stories. So the preservation of these myths, how are these myths showing up um, for both of you in this, on the stage, in the theater? You talk about Caribbean myth three. Can you break down Caribbean myth three for us, Michael? Okay, so um, so just to, just to tap in very quickly into something that you just said, which is that, and Caribbean myth three is about that. It's what is in the gap. It's the repositioning of all those characters and it's the re-powering of those characters. And you said that you talked about, um, you never knew that Anansi was not necessarily revered. He is in a way, but as a trickster god, as a little Anansi, Anansi is him, that kind of stuff. We talk about Anansi in that way. And, um, but that's also a kind of way, in the same way that Obia 
is uh, talked about in a negative way when Obia is African spirituality, and we need to really look at it. That is how European domination has, in its own way, insisted that African spirituality not be recognized in that particular way. And so, myth, myth, and Caribbean mythry is really taking something from myth, which is showing how supernatural creatures, supernatural beings, existed in the creative imagination and helped na nations to identify themselves. And so Germany has its own myths and the national, the, 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 the identity of Germany follows along the lines of the, um, the, the, their mythic characters. The same thing for the different regions around the world, right? Mm -hmm. In the Caribbean, we kind of got lost out um, in, in that space. Again, I talk about the 400 year gap. A lot of stuff was missing, but now we have access to it. In this day and age, we have access to it. And so we can pull from those supernatural ideas, those supernatural characters, those Orishas, those gods from the African diaspora and from the Caribbean diaspora. We can pull, and we have the right to pull from the European myths and the Chinese myths and because we have it all here. And that is exactly what we're doing. And so Caribbean mythry does exactly that. But in addition to that, Caribbean myth um, does something that's similar to what the, the national pantomime does, which is, you know, there are these, uh, these archetypes, these called some, in some ways, stereotypes um, in the pantomime. And if you talk to Brian, he would have recognized, talked about the Dane, he talked about the Anansi being there, the supernatural being that comes off uh, the, the coat of arms or different, you know, there are certain types of stuff. So what I've done with Caribbean myth is ensure that there are five characters who are mostly, if not all the time, most of the time represented. And these characters are the academic, um, and, and these characters, first of all, are, 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 are people or are, uh, sections of people who have been talking about blackness and black identity. And what I've done is throw them into conversation with each other. So the academic is there because the academics are studying stuff about blackness and identity. But it's only up a UA or in the university that people are talking about it. Rasta has always held the fort in terms of keeping blackness, black consciousness um, going. But if you're not Rasta, you might just think, oh, the dusty Rasta or the, you know, some people, people don't talk necessarily like that anymore, but some people are still on the fence with Rasta. Then you have um, the mother woman, African spirituality. They, you know, these people who have been holding the African identity to, together based on spirituality and spiritual concept. So these characters are there. And guess what I add in that? Two things. I add a doppy character or, a, or a, an ancestral spirit. And in addition to that, I add a bleacher youth, a youth from the corner who is bleaching his skin. Why? Because he also needs to be included in the conversation about blackness, about black identity. He has a perspective. His perspective might not be the one that we want to hear. He might not be the person who is saying, oh, yes, you must love your skin and love your skin color. Maybe he's the one who is saying, look, don't tell me about kings and queens of Africa. First of all, everybody could not be a king and queen in Africa. That's not how hierarchy works. So we're not all kings and queens. Tell me about it. And then the others have to explain. And he can say, all right, so why is it that I have to do this now? Why do you want me to do this? In one of the productions, in God of the Musical, um, one of the characters, the bleacher character, says to the um, says to Marcus Garvey himself. He says, um, "You know what is interesting? If you go downtown, if you go downtown Kingston, you will realize that every man pushing a handcart has three paintings on it at least: Emperor Haile Selassie, Marcus Garvey, and Bob Marley. But guess what? They're still pushing a handcart. Wow." So, so, so he has a perspective. He has a perspective that needs to be heard. And it's only in that Afrofuturistic perspective, which I have coined in my way and, and, and worked through in, in, in my form as Caribbean mythry, that people get an opportunity to hear his perspective alongside the perspective of the academic who has been doing the research and the Rasta and the African spiritual, uh, spiritualist and the ancestral voice, the, uh, the Orisha. And in Jamaica, we haven't necessarily had, um, we don't have, you know, like we don't have the Shango and Obatala and Oshun and Yemen, yeah. We don't have that directly, strongly in our culture as it is in Trinidad and in Cuba. 
but we can appropriate it. We can borrow it. We can take it. We can use it. And we can use them now to inform us. And we can even use, we have Kumina, so we can use how, how our own ancestral spirits and our doppies to talk to us from their perspective of so many years ago. This is what we went through. You bleach a youth. This is what me got you. Talk to me now. I love the, the bleach a youth character <clears throat> because Magli and I are smiling because the bleacher youth are our students, right? And also the bleacher youth for me is trap reggae, right? Now I know that trap, excuse me, trap hip, trap dancehall because they were saying there's no trap reggae, it's trap dancehall. <laughs> but I think about that in the sense, not, not as, not necessarily, well, the bleacher youth would be listening to trap dancehall in his iPod and whatever, but in the sense that the, here is this, um, this drive, this force, this push towards escaping a reality that is oppressing me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I am going to make it, it it's almost f like French for said. I'm going to make my, I'm going to create something that's more oppressive than my oppressors. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make that my God. And mm -hmm. I'm going to bow to that. And it's, gonna, it's going to be abrasive to my oppressors. And it's also going to be abrasive to me. And I know it. And I'm going to live in that space. So I really love how you bring, because usually you would never see, the, even if we bring in a youth, you wouldn't see the, the bleacher, the kid bleaching his skin. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not calling out no names. Uh, but several of them are represented in our dancehall heroes today. Several of them are my dancehall heroes as well. Um, Nakalo, no Gaza, or Gully Niam, or none of that. No names. No names. <laughs> brick from brick, all of it. We love them. <laughs> but, you know, but yeah. So, Tanya, speaking of, and, and then you go into the mother woman, Michael. You talk about the Obia, right? Obia. Oh, yes, God. Don't say Obia. Don't say it. It's scary. Mm -hmm. Obia, you say Obia among Jamaicans. You say Obia and Duppy. You, you're going to lose friends. But yeah. <laughs> one of the works that you worked on here, Tanya, was you published one of the first Jamaican plays, first written, tech considered contemporary classic Jamaican plays. You published about maybe three or four years ago, Pacamania, Una Martin. And talk, because Pacamania connects, you know, I'm just making this link because it connects to the mother woman, one of the characters. Talk to us about that piece of work. And then we're going to start taking some questions from the audience. Um, one of the interesting things about Pacamania is that it it is, <laughs> you know, there's there's a way in which Una Martin might have been a CEO woman. But I don't think she would have accepted that definition because in many ways she was a middle class black woman. Mm -hmm. And so what she um and so what she was looking at though was that pull for a black a black woman between that folk culture and the need for respectability, right? You know, and that that is a part of the the, the core that is at a paradox in Jamaica, and it's a part of the reason. We, we are a space where we love ourselves and hate ourselves so much. Like Jamaica is often in a split where we're always ready to big up Jamaican culture. But we're also in a way in which there is so much about us that we should love, including ourselves, that we denigrate. Mm -hmm. And at the core of that is that Black folk mm -hmm. culture, things like Pokemania that speak to an African spirituality mm -hmm. that because of slavery and colonialism, we cannot contend with because contending with it is our accepting a, a, a label that says we are backward. And that is mm -hmm. it. And that is why Jamaicans, before them said them like Tonka Neil, them would prefer to say them like Polenta, same mm -hmm. blasted thing. <laughs> um, you know, where we feel we have to turn the thing through the lens of some other respectability before we can accept it. So, you know, Pokemania written in, 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 in 19, well, performed in, in, in 1938, right, looks at this woman. She's always been pulled by the drums, but she cannot 
answer to the drums and live her respectable middle class life at the same time. And that is is that is a schism that is still in the in the Jamaican landscape so many more years later. And it was you know it was considered to be the forerunner of the Jamaican play. It was the first drama um, to use Jamaican Creole, right? To use Jamaican in it, not in uh, not as a way for creating laughter or comedy, which was significant because many of us still see Jamaican as a thing to talk when you are in a, 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 an informal space or to make a joke, but it is not the space for serious academia. It is not the space for serious conversation. And that's one of those battles that we still have to fight. And that is a part of what Pokemania brings to the table, you know? Yeah. And we, I should note that we, we co-published it with the National Library of Jamaica. Nice. So as we move into our question and answer segment of, um, of, the, of the talk, uh, one of our faithful listeners, <laughs> Chris Alid, um, she comes in every week and ha- gives us something to think about and to talk about. And she says, you know, we should have a Jamaican and Caribbean version of Dark Matter. You know, the book on speculative fiction from the African diaspora, you know, the name plays on that matter that is not directly observed, but whose existence is acknowledged by its gravitational effects. And she says, since this focuses uh, focuses on theater, what would be a collection of underprecedented Jamaican, mytholo- Jam- Jamatholo- Jamaican uh, mythology for stage in a futuristic context or reimagined in that context? Well, I'm not sure about, I'm gonna make Michael take the, the, the most direct part of the question in terms of um, what Jamaican plays he would put in there. But just to say that there is a Caribbean collection of speculative fiction, um, which came out of People Tree Press, edited by Karen Lord a couple of years ago. I'm not remembering the name right now. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember the name, but but there is such a collection. So you can go on the People Tree Press website and look out for that if that's work that you are interested in. And also, or publishing house, um, Blouse and Skirt Books, or imprint Blouse and Skirt Books through our publishing house, Blue Banyan Books, do put out work in that space. We have two works of Caribbean fantasy fiction. Well, three works of Caribbean fantasy fiction that's out there. So if you're looking for contemporary work, in that kind of space. Now over to you, Michael, answer the lady question. Okay. <laughs> I hope I can answer the question. What I will say is that, okay, so I have a novel called Night of the Indigo, which was also published in a fantasy fiction uh, collection. And it was it was edited by Joan Johnson from Trinidad. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and um, it's from Island Fiction. It's a, it's the, the, the collection was called Island Fiction. But I also believe that if you think about it, a lot of the things, you, the, the first book that you mentioned, Tanya, you said that we were looking at it as just fiction, but it was mm-hmm. also, um, so, so those That's types right. of books, right, those types yeah. of productions, plays could, could also be included, re-included in that kind of a, 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 a mm-hmm. collection. Pantomime stuff, rewritten and refocused and, you know, give it because, because what, as I said before, there is a there's a spectrum, there's a broad spectrum on what I would say is Afrofuturism. And in fact, you have productions like what um that, like the performing arts company puts mm-hmm. out. They're reassured, um looks to me like Afrofuturism. They're reassured is a production that deals with issues in the present from the future, mix it up with the past and, and, and repackages it in a way that is meant to empower us and give us a, a, a cultural aesthetic about Africa and the philosophies, a renegotiate of our space, positioning of our people and our gods and our spirituality and our identity, a re-empowerment of us as black people around who we are. So, you know, like what Quill doing, the, um, reassured, Ray McLean, um, some of what the pantomime has has put out, and there are people around who are doing stuff. I couldn't give you a name, right now, but I, I know that there is enough stuff that would go in a collection that would satisfy as um or, or, or qualify. 
You know, I'm glad you brought up Reassured and I'm glad you brought up Quilt because I've been stalking Rayon McLean <laughs> for about eight months over the display. And when I say I'm stalking him, I'm on, a, I'm on his Insta. I'm on his Facebook. He was on the conversation last week and I was stalking him there too because that play, Reassured, needs to be seen. Yeah. Jamaica cannot keep that play to itself. That is a healing vessel and it needs to be seen because we need that story. And also, Philip Sherlock Center can't keep that play to itself. Y'all got to get reassured out to every classroom in Jamaica, every primary and secondary school yeah. student in Jamaica needs to see. Re Listen, Grace. Digicel, whoever, who are the big money people down there, fund Reassured and get it touring because that piece is some real serious healing. Okay? And, I've been, and I, we're going to get it. We're, I, I don't know how we're going to get it. I'll get it for Rayon. <laughs> Akiba Abaka Arts. Akiba Abaka Arts. Please fund um, and, and get Reassured out there. <laughs> I'll call my banker. Uh, <laughs> I will call my banker. Yeah. My banker is going to be so busy. I'm not even going to say he's my banker, but I'll find one. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'm going to yeah. go to another question from, um, from TK Moore, um, is one of our audience members. And a lot of the, the, the people in the chat really want to know, Tanya, speaking a little slowly, can you name, because you're dropping gems, you're dropping some publishing gems. Would you mind just naming um, the plays that you've published, the works that are yours, and also just some of the books, if you could just repeat some of the names of the books. And if, if it's too much, just say where we can follow up to get okay. into this. Yes. So, so let me start with where you can follow up so I don't forget. So our website is bluebanyanbooks.com. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Blue Banyan Books, right? Banyan like the tree, right? Um, so that's the easiest one. So um, in terms of for our fan the fantasy books that we have done that I've mentioned, um, there is, we have two works by Imam Bashk, who is out of Guyana. He's a brilliant mind, right? He is, he does beautiful mashups of folklore. So his first book, Children of the Spider, is a reimagining of in, a Nancy in a contemporary space, mm -hmm. which mashes up um, African culture with contemporary um, Guyanese culture with European concepts. And he has a beautiful moment in there, spoiler alert, where a Nancy confesses that he actually went to New York and paid a guy to write a comic book about him. <laughs> Spider Man, right? So that so that's the kind of ways in which he borrows all kinds of folklore and makes it his. And then his second work is called The Dark of the Sea, which um, it looks at it reimagines the idea of mermaids and it explores um, questions of about racism and shadism because shadism is very important in the Caribbean. Right. We call it colorism up here. Right, yeah. Um, and so he, if the dark of the sea looks at that kind of stuff and he reimagines the ideas of mermaids. He borrows from, I am the worst at names. It is, there's currently a show that does the same thing on HBO. Um, it is taken everybody. Gods, or, hmm? What? American Gods, is it? You're talking no, about? not American Gods. Um, it's, it's, oh God, it takes an American writer, um, the, the Sula, I, I don't remember his name. Oh my goodness, I can't remember. Um, Lovecraft, right. It, no. So he, he borrows from Lovecraft. He has Hindu gods. He has mermaids in there. He has um, uh, Roman gods and all kinds of things fighting in this one space under the Caribbean Sea, right? And where he talks about what it means to be a hero and redefining what it is to be a hero. So he's a very interesting writer. That's Imam Bash. We mm -hmm. also have, she has such a beautiful sense of humor. Um, this uh, writer out of Barbados, Shakira Bourne. Um, 
we published the novel as um, as my fishy stepmom, where she looks at um, Mami Wata, the Mami Wata character, mm. um, which is I'm going to say she's a sister or a cousin <laughs> to the the River Mama figure, um, and she, but it's set in contemporary um, Barbados and it explores ideas of female empowerment as well as father daughter love and friendship. And you know all of all of this stuff. Um, I think it's being republished um, in the in the U.S. and the U.K. sometime this year or next year under a different name. But Shakira Bourne's "My Fishy Stepmom." You can definitely look out for that if you're interested in seeing how Caribbean folklore is being um, reinterpreted. And just um, I guess this is also it. My own collection of fiction for children, Pumpkin Belly, and other stories also looks at that. Um, I have included in that a River Mama story where a young girl encounters uh, a, a River Mama and has to, to stage a strike. <laughs> um, so it's very, it's, it's really very contemporary, that kind of thing. Um, you know, yeah, those, those are the things we have in fiction based on, based on what we have put out. So in fantasy fiction that we have put out so far. Right. Awesome. Just, I know Magalie's going to jump in here, but real quick, the, and the Mami Wata character is a um, of the uh, 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 Ifa um, cos African cosmology. So to see mm-hmm. her in the um, in Barbados makes totally total sense. And also, what you're saying about the European gods fighting in the Caribbean waters. Yes, they were fighting in the Caribbean waters, honey. <laughs> let me tell you, they had their gods written on the name of their boats, and we were in the vessel. So that's Afrofuturism. Now we are telling a new story. We were in the belly of those boats named after their gods. So it's not only fiction and fantasy, but you, you it's historical fiction when they when we start to write into these spaces, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I know Magdalene has a question for us, so I'll, I'll step out of the way. <laughs> Yeah, well, more of a, um, a, a comment that one of our viewers um, um, said, and uh, I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, huh, you know, earlier, Tanya, you were saying how you had a hard time with um, the term Afrofuturism, because as a Jamaican, you know, it's just like, J- we're Jamaican, we're African, it's one, right? So to separate it, it wasn't really something that um, you do, right? It's, it's all one. But Mario um, says, you know, I think if Jamaicans were interacting with Africans more, we would look at our own heritage differently. We need to have Africa as part of our daily lives, business, politics, culture. So what do you think can about- Can be politically incorrect? You can- you can, of course, do, you can. Do, do. The thing is that they said they don't like us. Some people believe that the Africans don't necessarily, they call us the Islanders and stuff like that. It's been said. And, and so I'm just telling you, and I, I believe in large measure, it's a part of that kind of divide and conquer strategy, which has been, you know, played against us for the longest time with the Maroons and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things that they say is that um, sometimes the Africans think of us as the ones who were... Taken away. Yeah, yeah, in a way, you know, so we are, we are, it's almost like the bastard child in a way. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm saying it correctly, but I'm just telling you the kinds of things that I've heard. And those are the things that um, we need to counter by doing exactly what um, Mario, you said, um, suggests that we should be in, 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 in more dialogue so that we can, we can uh, get rid of those things if they're not true. And if they are true, then address them and deal with them, that kind of thing. I'd I'd, I'd, I'd love to to add to that. And I I have heard that sentiment before, but I think as well, and and this is, you know, this is, I, I, I I was writing a tweet earlier and I said, I was responding to something and I was saying that it's true, but like all truths, it's not the whole story. Uh, Um, and, and so, and so, you know, um, the, so even when I say many Jamaicans see ourselves as such, it is a schism again. Like I remember when, I remember the first time I had an argument with Miss Lou. Of course, Miss Lou wasn't there. It was an argument in my head. <laughs> and I'm well brought up, so I wouldn't have argue with Miss Lou <laughs> to our face, right? Um, and it was over colonization. No, um, no back to Africa, Miss Matty. 
Mm. And I say this as, and this was on like a third reading of Back to Africa, Miss Matty. Because like the first time I had, I read that Back to Africa, me and Miss Lou were on the same page. I was like, what you talking about? We're Jamaican, back to what? Right? And then as my own politics and understanding grew and I was able to make more space for opinions that were different from mine. So I, I, I was never at a back to Africa phase, but I could, I had grown to be able to respect and understand the value of that positioning. And that was when I was like, Miss Lou, you can't diss the people them something, so you can't just, you can't, you can't just take it, so, you know. And um, and I, I remember there, so there is a way in which, whereas we often valorize the African, it's a mythical Africa that we valorize, and not what contemporary Africa is today. So Mario is is really really right. There mm-hmm. is a way in which we need to reconnect. I remember years ago when I was teaching, so that was one long time ago, um, that we we went to see that, uh, I forget the name of the movie. Anyway, we went to see a movie and I was teaching high school and a fourth former came up to me and said, Miss, Africa isn't a country. And because we often talk about Africa as though it is one space. Mm -hmm. And it is because we don't engage with it much. And it is, and as much as we are talking about myth we hear, and that is a truth that we need to explore, we also need to to have interactions with the contemporary, with what Africa is and what Africa was. Mm -hmm. You know, that thing about how we are different and how they are different because we have so much in common, but there is also changes. Because you can't, you can't travel through the belly of a boat, be spat up by, spat up by history, and come out the same. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it, I, I, I forget the name of the author who said that, that the Caribbean was a crucible of pain, you know? So yeah, we're going to be different from our African brothers and sisters, and we need to recognize and accept that, but we also need to get to know them again as well, yeah. as well as they need to get to know us. That's, that's my positioning on that, for sure. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to engage this a bit, and then we're going to start to close out with our dreamscape. Um, but I'm so happy that Mario, thank you, Mario, for bringing us here with the Africa question, because it's Afrofuturism. And so I'm just gonna bullet point and say some things and then sum up what I'm saying. So like, we got Garvey, right? Major Afrofuturist, Black Star Liner, right? The Black Star Liner. Afrofuturism connecting to the, um, the cosmos, right? That same Black Star ends up in the middle of Ghana's flag. It's the same Black Star, right? Because Nkrumah invited Garvey and Du Bois back home. Du Bois took the invitation, Garvey didn't. But what Nkrumah did is he put that black star in the middle of that flag, right? So we, 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 I'm going to just deal with this, this triangle, right? And then we're coming back now with a thing called reggae music, right? And the we, Bob Marley is elevated because Bob Marley was smart. Bob Marley was a country man and he listened to those stories and he brought those stories forward. But there was Toot, the great Toots and Toot Hibbert who just passed away, you know, um, Jimmy Cliff. So many of our writers, um, we talk about Sister Nancy. There are just a lot of writers in the reggae space. And if you really listen to the stories that they're telling about um even, even Sister Nancy, that her, her most famous song, Bam Bam, about me as a woman, as a power, and this is who I am, and let me tell you what where I stand. All of these are elements, right, of um, how Afrofuturism has been in the Jamaican space and also how it shows up in theater, because when we think of theater, we think of the fourth wall, the space with the fourth wall that you don't break. But for African people, theater is every conversation is where the theater is where I have an audience. So the theater is wherever you are paying attention to me. For African people, there's no separation, right? And so um, 
the one thing I learned, to, to, an, another is that I want to elevate is, is Kwame Kwa Arma. Kwame Kwa Arma has a play called A Statement of Regret that talks about, that looks at um, the Africa, I call it the Africa question for us of the classic that classical diaspora. And we're the classical diaspora because we were the first to, to leave en masse, right? We, the, 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 the children of, um, of those ancestors. And in it, he addresses that subject of um, how African people see us and the, the disconnect and the trauma for our African, our continental African brothers and sisters and the Africans of the, um, the classical diaspora. And we heard it when, when Black Panther came out, all my Nigerian friends was like, y'all Americans are funny, y'all got jokes. I, that, that, that's not over here, we don't know. And we said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a comic and we're having a good time. So you, you definitely, Mario, you bring up a good point, you know, okay, all this Afrofuturism, all this storytelling, but when do we make the connections? But the connections require some naming and some renaming of things and claiming and reclaiming of culture and identity. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when, when I was in West Africa, a guy saying to me, you Americans. And I said, I'm not American, I'm, I'm Jamaican. Don't you call me no American. He said, well, well, what continent is Jamaica in? And honey, on that day and forevermore, I am African American forever because I'm in the continent you know, I was born in, in, in the continent of North America. So there's so many levels of this thing. There are levels to this thing. And we, as I said earlier, 10 weeks, 10, week 10 of 10 weeks is an opening, not a closing. Week 10 is a is an is is the is the this is where we bust the, the gate wide open for the conversations to begin. I know we're gonna start talking. So as we move, <laughs> as we move ahead, um, every week we do a thing called a dreamscape. And this week's dreamscape, dreamscape is our visioning into the future, um, uh, our dreaming into the future. And so for this week, I'm going to be a little creative and be a little theater artist here. And I'm going to pose the dreamscape to y'all like this. And we all can dreamscape into the space. Keep it short because we're at the end. Um, a Jamaican or anybody is watching these, these recordings, the recordings of these uh, conversations 30 years from now. So we're not gonna go too far, just 30 years. 30 years into the future. What is the society, the Jamaican society, and even the global society that they are watching these conversations from? So where are they societally? What have we created? And what are they looking for when they watch us in this conversation? I'm gonna start with Michael. Yeah, so Jamaica is, uh, as somebody had said to me a long time ago, Jamaica is a glandular spot on the globe. And there's, a, there's something from the National Geographic, which um, apparently said that not since the island of Crete has an island state had such a powerful impact on the world. And so Jamaica has had that powerful impact on the world through Bob Marley, through Marcus Garvey, through um, so many people, you saying both and on and on and on. That person 30 years from now is looking at um, us, looking at this and saying, wow, these people are talking about um, and projecting into a future that we're living in now. And these people are have created and helped to foster the creation of mix of, of, of stories that helps to empower my parents who brought me to this space of strong empowerment where I am on top of the world, where, um, you know, like how Dubai is this powerfully rich country where um, thing there, everybody goes to, because the greatest currency at that time is going to be culture. The greatest currency at that time will be creativity. The greatest currency at that time will be intellectual activity that has been creative um, and put in a, in a creative sphere. And because the greatest currency will be that empowered space, that electrical empowered space that is born from the gap, that person watching from 30 years in the future is saying, oh my God, thank you so much for explaining how we got here. <laughs> Birdstone poet, Tanya, what is your dreamscape? So um, I have to reshift it because I'm a kind of person who sees darkly. 
And so I was glad you, <laughs> you made Michael go first so I could, you know, change the change <laughs> the vision a little bit. And I'm going to hold up my glass. I don't know if you can, uh, it, I think the light is, you can't, you can't see. Blue banyan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, not the blue banyan part. It's the writing in gold beneath it. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not showing up. So my cousin gave this to me because it is something for Christmas, because it's something that I say all the time. And I, I shame my pug, my sister's company, Ellie Mac Designs, does those glasses, puts, you know, whatever you want on it. Mm -hmm. um, it says the, the, the words it says is reading is fundamental. And so the future I imagine is one where we have finally got rid of the lie that says Jamaicans don't read, black people don't read. What I see, regardless of, regardless of what else happens, I think there's always hope because in story is humanity, is possibility, is hope. And so much of that storying, so much of that myth making is, 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 can be kept within, within books. And so for me, the future I want to see um, 30 years from now is where when you say that, that lie is shot down immediately. That, simply put, that is what I want to see. A, 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 a future where we once again fully embrace stories, whether they are through books, whether they are through film, whether they, however they are. Because the griot, the storyteller, the person who brings your history to your now, they're fundamental to who you are and who you can become. And so that's that's a simple future, I imagine. Yeah, wow. done. <laughs> that is, you all hit, wow, 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 woo. Sweep over my soul. I gotta pause. And listen to that. Culture will be the currency. And black people, we read Amen. and we write and we have the right to, to rewrite. That's dope. If, if, oh. It is. If I, if I could put, there, there's a quote by, um, it's not often heard, it's by Jamaica Kincaid. And she was talking about um, a book she did a few years ago where she got some frack because the characters in it were white Jewish um, people. And, and she, she, she was like, people thought she shouldn't write about such people. Um, and she said, one of the things that's happening in the contemporary world is um, people are realizing that not only do black people read, but they also write. And, you know, I just like that, that is a part of, of what feeds into this kind of thing. And yeah, yeah. we need to connect more with, with our, our writers. We have a ton of them who've done fascinating work that we need to connect with and reconnect with and put mm -hmm. out there. And like what you guys are doing, these conversations, as well as interpreting them into plays that, that must, that must happen more and more, you know? Yeah. Well, I am going to thank you both for being here with us and for being the um, amazing Renaissance artist that you are. That's what I've called you. That's what you're gonna be from now on, forever more <laughs> for me. Um, this conversation, I, yeah, this is a major rewatch. I will be rewatching and writing down. And for those of you who um, wanna know the names of the books, just go to Blue Banyan Publishing, okay? Bluebanyan.com, or just rewatch the whole interview because- you <laughs> so, um, I'm going to tell you all, thank you before we close out and just thank you all. For, thank you, um, Tanya and Michael for being here. And um, as we close out, Magali and I, um, as we said, this is the opening. So Magali and I now will do our dreamscape. It's after 10 weeks. Um, I'm going to start first because I'm going to forget. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years from now, and this is personal, 30 years from now, my dreamscape is I am a grandmother or I'm on the way to being a grandmother and I am telling my grandchildren about how my grandmother and my uncle gave me my name. And inside of that story, 
will be the stories that will empower and form their future because that's what that story did for me. I'm telling a story to my grandkids and you know, those grandkids live wherever they want in the world and they look whatever way they wanna look like in the world. And they listen to what they wanna listen to in the world. So what's your dreamscape bags? My dreamscape is that 30 years from now, um, the sharing of stories, like I was thinking all this and then Tanya started to talk and I was like, yes, yes. Um, all the stories that were, that we sought out, you know, late in our lives and we're, and we're still seeking and we're teaching and kids are, are craving to know about it. And every time we tell them, it's like, a, oh, it won't, they won't, it won't, they won't be a surprise anymore because it'll be part of everyday life. You know, you learn about um, Abraham Lincoln and you learn about Christopher Columbus, but we don't learn about, you know, the bookman, you know, we don't learn about Toussaint Louverture. We don't learn about these, these people who are part of our DNA. They are part of our DNA. Literally and figuratively. I mean, seriously, right? And we don't learn about them. And then when we do, it's like, oh my. And so I want to get rid of that. I'm hoping that that oh my is does not like disappear so that it's not interesting. It it's just that every time these stories come up, it's just like well yes, but of course well yeah, you know what I mean. And so as the sharing continues, it just becomes part of what we do. We wake up every morning, we wash our face, you know, we brush our teeth, and we tell a story. We share a story. And because it's part of what we need to do to keep the stories alive. That's my dream scheme. Well, 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 my, 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 my. For the past 10 weeks, we have been saying that Jamaican people have a saying. They say, walk good. It means blessings on you in all your journeys. We actors, we theater people, we have a saying. We say, see you on the boards. It means see you at the next job. We hope you get the next gig. So here's the deal. Walk good on the boards. You hear? 